Hello, everybody. Welcome to the launch of Between the Lines 2022. Um, very happy to uh, show you a wonderful lineup of uh, readers who've all submitted work um, that's been published in Between the Lines. Um, uh, throughout, um, I will every so often post, as I'm going to do right now, um, a link to where you can also purchase uh, or get a copy of the um, the ebook um, for free um, in the chat. So that's there if you need it as well. Um, but without further ado, um, I'm going to start with our first reader today, who is Hilary Thomas, um, with a piece called Couples. Um, Hilary, over to you. Hello. So, yeah, this is um, part of a YA uh, novel that I'm writing, and it's um, part of a chapter called Couples. So here goes. From the corner of his eye, Sajid could see Lucy watching him. Irritated, he spun round and barked. What's your problem? Do you fancy me or something? No, she protested, spinning her head fast into the text that had been placed between them. A couple of other students glanced over at Sajid, and he opened his mouth to bark at them too. But Miss Apia called Sajid in a long and drawn out voice, warning him not to start creating. What? He muttered back and then kissed his teeth loud enough to assert his frustration, but quiet enough so Miss Appear wouldn't hear him. Then shuffling his chair away from Lucy, though given he had already turfed her out of the window seat, there was nowhere really for him to shuffle to, he turned his tight, vexed face to the window. He looked without purpose into the street below, picking up the everyday nothingness that sprawled out in all directions. He watched with half empty eyes, the long thread of crawling traffic, nose to butt, stopping and starting along Crispin Street. A bus pulled up and someone got off. Then it pulled away along the bus lane and it was gone out of sight. People disappeared under the covered market and others emerged out into the open. A man pushed an empty wheelbarrow around the back of a white van. The sky was cloudy, but bits of light blue were seeping through and Sajid watched the thinning clouds float away. He longed for English to be over and for break time to come when he could get out onto the pitch. But English seemed to be going on forever. And so Sajid continued to drift with the flow of dull life outside. Further down the street, he noticed an old couple shuffling towards the market. They held hands like teenagers. He wondered what it was like to be old and in love. He thought how he might, he thought how much his nan must miss his granddad and felt sorry for her that she'd lost her husband, who she must have held, uh, who must have held her hand like that too at some point. How nice it must be to have a soulmate. He wondered if he and Henna might still know each other when they were grown and old. And he remembered what his nan had once said. Sometimes when two people love each other, it's not enough to keep your hold in hands. Together forever is only possible when you find the Lord. She'd looked up at the ceiling at the time, like she was thinking deeply. And Sajid had wondered whether she'd been thinking about her Lord or her husband. He thought about his parents. Did they hold hands, like Romeo and Juliet, two star-crossed lovers? Why did his dad have to return to Bangladesh? 
and why hadn't he ever re uh, returned? A lump rose in his throat and he had to hold his breath just for a second to stop himself from choking up. He remembered that his granddad's funeral, his nan never cried, not once. She must miss him terribly. He twisted his head over his shoulder and followed the old couple as they disappeared, past the covered market and round the corner. He'd forgotten where he was until Lucy's intrusive and excited voice pierced through and brought him back to the din of the classroom. He struggled to decipher what she was saying to him. Thou mayst prove false at lovers' perjuries. Startled, he screwed up his face and looked at her. What? he said defensively. Thou may prove false at lovers' perjuries, she repeated. I think she's calling him a liar. See? She ran her fingers along the explanation in her dictionary and read aloud. Perjuries, to willfully tell an untruth or willfully make a misrepresentation. Sajid followed her fingers with his eyes, but in his mind he struggled to connect, demanding, what you on about purgatory? She took a short while, it took a short while for Sajid to stop feeling irritated by Lucy's further explanations and for her meaning to slot in with his being. And in that time, something brief but deep connected with him. Her eyes stood out against the dark green of her blazer. And Sajid wondered how strange it was that two colors seemingly the same, but for a shade or two difference, could be set so strikingly against each other. Lucy, was the first to speak. She read the rest of Juliet's speech to him. When she finished, she looked up. Sajid, for no reason other than he felt a warmth coming from inside, started to laugh. Lucy must have understood because she smiled. And Sajid thought, yeah, she was all right. At the end of the lesson, he picked up his bag and stood up to leave. He looked down at her slowly packing her pencil case and awkwardly nudged her on the shoulder with his fist and mumbled, don't get it twisted or anything, but you made an all right, Juliet. And that's it. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much, Hilary. Really, really beautiful piece. So coming up next is Michael Dickinson with Lost Not Lost. Thanks, Thomas. Um, apologies, uh, firstly, um, I'm backstage at a theatre and there's every possibility a Tannoy announcement will be made uh, during this reading. Uh, I happen to be in a dressing room and it's the busiest Tannoy time of the day so apologies for that this is a piece i submitted at the end of um uh of the ways into creative writing course with the brilliant claire bailey and uh, and a fantastic uh, group of students i have to say the feedback and the the commentary around it was 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 really great and the conversations were fantastic it's a kind of mashup of themes we were looking at um to do with time you know the past present and future and the character of the narrative voice so i thought i'd throw it at the wall and see what what, what happened. It's called Lost, Not Lost. Salty tears were gushing from somebody's eyes, blinding him, running into his mouth, hot and salty tears. He wasn't lost. They just didn't know where he was. I was boiling my eyes out. I was shaking. A man saw me. He held my hand and walked me down the road. You told the might be bad man your phone number? Why were you even talking to him? How many times? You do not talk to these people, these awful men on the streets. I'd known the number since I could speak. Everybody had drilled it into me. It used to be a word and four numbers. 
I knew it backwards, Notrepla 1921, but now it was just seven numbers. U 9981291. Might be bad, pointing to the wall. Why don't you sit there? I'll get you a drink. You stop crying. Nothing bad has happened. The might be kind man will fetch a drink and make the call. He will speak to everybody. Or your dad. Nobody in particular. Might be kind. Wall, waiting for him to return. A boy appeared. He just appeared, out of nowhere, an older boy. Boy, my dad said you could come inside. The boy walked back into the house. Somebody followed him. Boy, do you need to go to the toilet? Somebody did. The boy took him upstairs. He went into the bathroom. There was a soapy smell. Lavender? The older boy stood by the open door, watching. Somebody pulled down the front of his shorts. He wanted to wee, but nothing happened. Boy, are you okay? Somebody, yes. He started to shake. He cried again, not sobbing, just short out breaths that got stuck in his throat. He redressed the front of his shorts and turned to the boy. The boy put the palm of his hand around the back of somebody's head and pressed it ever so gently against his chest. It was nice. Somebody liked it. This had never happened before. The boy took somebody to a bedroom, his. The sun was drilling into the room, heat blazing through the windows, dust dancing in the light, thousands of pieces of airfix on the shelves, hanging from the ceiling, trains, cranes, warplanes. Boy, my dad's gone out, somebody. Oh, boy, he's gone to find your parents, I think. Somebody, he said he was going to ring them. Boy. We don't have a phone. That's weird. Probably gone to a phone box. There was a silence. They sat on the bed. The boy put his hand on somebody's knee. There was music in somebody's head. His brother liked Bob Dylan. Something is happening here, but you don't know what it is. Somebody trembled. The boy was nice. Boy, I'd like to kiss you. Somebody, wondering if he would, wishing he could. Oh. Boy, please, somebody, no, I, please, I don't, boy, shut the door. Somebody felt weak. He did what he was told. The boy walked towards him. He wasn't much taller. He leaned in. Boy, kiss me. Somebody, okay. He stood on the tips of his toes. He gave the boy a very quick kiss on his cheek. Boy, nothing to it, is there? Somebody. No. Boy. It's nice, isn't it? Getting a boy. Somebody. Kind of. Yeah, suppose. Boy. Would you like to kiss my mouth? Somebody. No, I... Somebody felt hot. He tried to leave. Boy. Please. Just once. Try it out. He leaned in again. Their faces were close. Somebody kissed him on the lips and pulled away. Somebody. Okay. Boy, that was just a peck. I meant a kiss, a proper kiss. The boy leaned in again. Boy, like this. Their lips met and moved around a bit. There was a tongue in somebody's mouth that wasn't his. There was no force. He was tender, loving, kind. Somebody wished it felt wrong. It should have felt wrong. Everything he knew was that it was wrong to kiss boys, but it didn't feel wrong. It wasn't. It just wasn't wrong. It was lovely. Somebody. One more and then I'm going, OK? He stood on the bed. The boy went to him. Somebody leaned in. They were, his sisters called it, snogging. There's the man. He's talking. Man. Hi. The might be kind man is saying he's called your parents. He's spoken to your sister. Your dad is on his way. You're saying you like the air fix. Might be kind. Oh, that's Adrian's. He's gone to the park with some friends. You start to say he's inside, but then you stop. Might be kind is talking to you as if you're an adult. He's saying that Adrian's a bit old for all that stuff, really. He's saying he'll be back when he's hungry. He's asking you if you like Coca-Cola. You're nodding yes. 
but you've never tasted it. Somebody, or is he other, sat on the wall. He had no idea where he'd been, who he'd seen, or what had just happened. He didn't truly know who he was for a while. He was just somebody, or other. For all he knew, he was Adrian. Was he Adrian? Somebody or other saw Adrian, saw him, knew him. They kissed. It was beautiful. The seems to be kind man is cracking open a bottle of Coca-Cola. Seems to be. You can sit on the bonnet of my car if you like. You. The TR7. The green one. Is that yours? The wishy was my dad kind man who owns a TR7 is nodding. Wishy was. It certainly is. Come on, little soldier. Wishy was is lifting you onto the bonnet of the TR7. You're drinking the Coca-Cola and wishy was is giving you another. Whatever happens now, you're thinking you'll get home without any teeth at all. Nobody is arriving in the Zephyr. He and Wishy Was are shaking hands. Nobody is ruffling my hair in a pretending to be a nice dad way. Wishy Was seeing straight through it. Don't be too harsh. Nice car. Zephyr? Pretending to be. Yes, thanks. TR7. Wishy Was is going indoors. Nobody is driving me home. You should have hidden the gin. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, thank you. Um, so coming up next, we have Helen Deal uh, with the poem, The Place We Made. Helen, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, I was on a couple of courses with Christina and I was not terribly good at rhyming poems, but I was quite pleased with this one. It's a rubaiyat. And I will start reading it to you now. Hope you like it. The place we made. We make a wildflower garden where the pinks and the purples blend, where leaves tickle the yellowed stone at the lichen bench at one end. And from the heart of the rowan, angels sing when the wind chimes blow. White lights loop its wrists like bangles. One pink balloon drifts on its own. In May, we light her five candles, when last year we hadn't the will. We speak of her without anger. What gnawed and spat becomes still. We go to this place we made her and sit on the bench to remember. Her bedtime book we read over and over over and over and over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you for reading. Um, so next we have Joanna Lyons-Little with um, The Orange Grove. Joanna. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yes, I'm going to be reading this splash piece, The Orange Grove. You offer the tumblers on a plate, the brim of your straw hat shading your eyes so I can't read you. How is this enough? Last night we argued, then lay like driftwood on the outer edges of our bed. Take one, you say. I don't want to, but my mouth is dry as the path we're walking. You were insistent, persuading me to come to Santa Catarina when I'd only known you for six weeks using your trust fund to rent this solar panel glass walled home with its eight acres of land. Now you're rushing to move on again, to charter a boat to Puerto Rico. I'm too scared to tell you I get seasick. And besides, I want to make our project here work because it's ours, the only thing we really do together. I choose the ripest fruit and bite into the flesh distractedly. When I look up, you're smiling as if this were just a picnic on a summer's day. I hate that. You think it's settled. I finish the fruit, drop the stone on the ground and redo my ponytail so it's tighter. What if I can give you what you want here, I ask. We've been through this, you can't. The crops are puny. We'll never be self-sufficient. We're at the market every bloody week, but we love the market. Your look couldn't be more condescending. Come on, I say softly. Just another week before we make arrangements? I stroke your cheek, which is rough as weathered teak. 
I want to rub almond oil into it, like that time I gave you a massage on the veranda, and afterwards I licked your back, your neck, your breasts, and joked that you tasted like amaretto. Giggling, you asked me if I wanted ice with that. A week, you sigh, thinking it's one of my whimsies, a pointless delay. But after you fell asleep last night, I knelt by the bed, elbows resting near the small of your back, my fingers interlaced and pressed to my forehead, just as my late mother taught me all those years ago in that drafty flat in Herd Bay, overshadowed by the gloom of the North Sea. No wonder as soon as her funeral was over, you wanted to take me away and no wonder I let your excitement sway me. A year in a South American paradise, living off the land, away from the social media needs of never satisfied clients. But my mother would have disapproved of my prayers. I didn't turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary, but to the local deity, Oxum, Our Lady of Rivers and Waterfalls. Go back to bed, Oxum said. Love on its own is enough. Magic will only complicate matters. But I pleaded until she took pity on me. When something's offered to you overflowing with love, she said, give me the leftovers. That's it? I'd expected some kind of epic quest. Well, I wouldn't say it was easy myself, Oxen replied. But yes, leave them for me on your eight acres of land. You take my hand from your cheek and guide my finger into your mouth, sucking the tip, my nickel, knuckle, then down to the valley where the skin dips and rises up the other side again. As your mouth fills with saliva, I bump along the edges of your teeth. I follow you back to the house and back to bed. We stay there wrapped in one another's breath until the sun goes down and we both want dinner. The next morning I'm up and dressed before you've had a chance to reach for your glasses and mumble about coffee. I'm sorry we argued, I say, placing a mug on your bedside table. You are? You plump the pillows and sit up. I am, yes. Beach day? We haven't been for weeks. The waves crest and we swim, read and talk. I make sure to interest and amuse you. When we return to the house that evening, I pull you into the shower. Ooh, what have I done to deserve this? You turn to face the wall so I can ladder foam across the islands of your back. Afterwards, I sit at the kitchen table and wait restlessly. You slice up an orange and offer me a segment. I bite down onto citrusy pulp. When you're not looking, I spit the pips into my hand and slip them into the pocket of my robe. You sit at your laptop and look up tides and forecasts. I'm going out to check on our crops, I call, sliding feet into Birkenstocks. There's no point, you shout back. The next day, I insist you come to our land and, thinking a truce has been reached, you humour me. We see them as we pass through the gate of the walled garden, rows and rows of leaf green trees glowing with oranges like hundreds of individual globes. You stand still and stare. Oh, thank you, goddess Oxum. What's this? You ask at last, the edge back in your voice. It's what you've always wanted, for you to keep me here. Is that what you think? But you said. You drop my hand and walk away through the fruit heavy trees, the white ribbon on your straw hat slowly disappearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. I love the slipping the orange pips into the um, pocket of your robe. Really, really lovely image there. Um, thank you, Joanna. Um, so coming up next, we've got Rashika Williams with a poem to be heard. Rashika, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, to be heard is a monosyllabic poem, and this is the beginning of it. And the whole piece is an excerpt from a book length poem called Kiss Do Not Tell. To be heard. Dance with me, lay me down, spun in the white, the red wet, the brick, the blue frowned, black, with wide green smiles, the bruise shrunk in my... In my sides, the edge felt shy, so shy to be seen. Then it heard it had a voice. 
Dance with me, lay me down, spun in the white, the red wet, the brick, the blue frowned, black. Black skirt peeped with green tongues, wide licked, licked out of teeth, half bite, sort of smile. That long line in my cheek wrecks my mind, slow down, in and out, though not a sigh. The bruise shrunk as a lamp fused in my, in my sides, the edge felt shy so shy to be seen, till it heard, it heard, it had a voice. I heard it was me, me heard it was I. First it was noise, I thought I heard sounds, a noise I knew, I thought I know that voice. Me felt the same, and then we were we, but I am not I, and she is not me, and as we, we are three. Go on, we said, grab a chair, turn off the light some, Sit low to the ground to see, to feel what I mean, to touch the scar and feel the hurt. When you know the pain, you will know it. You will not know if, but you will not know why. You will not know how. You may not know when, and then you wake, drop pin stabs, and you scream while all life lays still. As you are pulled up wrong in a bed. Your yarn, the thought, yanked tight, hard, fast, tugged, a pull string, broke skin, false out of whose mouth, in one fast, long, hard breath. Did the train start with his name? Who knows? I do not want you to know me, is the truth that I heard, but me thought there was more. Yet there it was, out and loud, with no sound, but loud and fast. Who said it? As a friend waits near Sloan Square, I got late to walk, too late to walk to the tube, late for the bus, the bus was late, stuck in cars, cars late, all in a rush, but all life was still as. Me heard it. Me felt it as well. Me did not want you to know I. Though we thought we heard the words, we knew there was no sound. Though we heard them loud, as well, they were loud, they were fast, in a string strung, twist the cord of steel and pull. It pulled fast from my base, out past my throat with force. It had her will. It was her voice. But she is dead now, and I, me, and we sat in grief. As we fall to the floor, it was pure, it was fact, it was old, it was new, it was her, it was it, is it. I heard her, me felt her, and me felt I hear us, and I felt me feel us, and our hearts beat it. Out of sync, it felt twice the speed, then we joined me and I in, all three out of sync. As we saw her watch, we can see from her eyes. But she is dead now, and her corpse sits up in my sleep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashika. Um, brilliant rhythm. I'd, I'd be really interested to hear that put to music. I was thinking halfway through, but that yeah, no, really, really, um, really powerful. Thank you very much, Rashika. Um, so coming up next, and and then we'll have a brief break. Um, is Roy Trevelyan? Roy, over to you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, and um, this is a short story uh, from the short story course I did uh, with um, City Lit last year. Um, it's a, um, a flash short story. And because of one of the characters I mentioned in uh, the story, uh, it's important to remember that I wrote it last year, not this year. It's called The Aura. You're sitting in a large tent with other children from the council estate, and you're having a tea party because it's the day of the coronation. You each have a tea plate and a teacup and saucer. It's a brightly decorated tea set with a picture of Queen Elizabeth wearing a hat. She's surrounded by flags, a lion, a unicorn, and there's a crown at the top over her picture. It's a noisy party. Sometime later, a film of the coronation is broadcast. You don't remember when. It could be after the school holidays, or perhaps after many years. But you go to Mrs Burns's flat to see it, because she's the only one who has a television. 
It's a tall wooden box with a small screen angled at the top. Your father says the TV is 11 inches. The pictures are black and white. Mrs. Burns has old dark brown furniture and everything is kept exactly as it was when Mr. Burns was alive. But he's been dead for a long time and you didn't ever know him. On the mantelpiece above Mrs. Burns's empty grate rests a large wooden framed clock. Time, the time still shows a quarter to 11 because that's the time, says Mrs. Burns, that her son died in the first war. The clock just stopped, she says. It's been silent ever since. The film on the TV makes you fidgety. You want to go out and play. Instead, you watch a carriage going down the street and people sit and stand in a big church. The Queen's soldiers wear dark jackets with bright sashes and medals. The exciting part of the coronation comes when they put a large crown on the Queen's head. It looks heavy. Then you get a strange, white, jagged light that keeps flashing in your eye. You've got a headache and you feel sick. You're taken home and your mother puts you to bed. You ask her to shut the curtains because the daylight hurts. You're rushed to the bathroom to be sick. You're a healthy, strong five-year-old, says Dr. Hughes the next day, but your mum did right to tuck you up with the curtains closed and the lights off. Then in a whisper to your mother, the doctor says, let's hope it doesn't happen again, but quite fit now for school. Some years later, it happens again. You're almost grown up, and now a few families in the flats have televisions just like Mrs. Burns's. You're at home watching TV, and then there are these shocking pictures of starving people locked behind wire. It looks really cold. You notice that some men are not wearing jackets. Their ribs stick up under the skin. The uniform is strange. It's made of thin material with black and white stripes on the jackets and the trousers. You find out the men are locked up in this camp and starve to death because they're Jews. You can't believe it. The announcer tells you about the torture they have to go through before they're shot or gassed. Then you see the jagged white light again. Your head hurts badly. You go to bed with the lights off and the curtains closed. The next day, the doctor calls the white light the aura. Weeks later, you dream about the death camp. You are a guard there and you start to torture and shoot the prisoners. Bright red blood runs down the striped shirts and onto the brown wooden bunks in the huts. Bullets spray more blood all over the dark green painted woodwork. Hot red blood splashes onto you and into your face. You wake up shouting out your own name. Then, it's all right, love, calls your mother. Only a dream. At last, you're at Freshers' Week at the Polytechnic. Other students want to know if you dream in colour. Have your parents bought a colour television? Can they afford one? They tease you, but you stay silent. Tell us they laugh. Do you dream in colour? No, you say, but that's a lie because you remember the dream about the death camp. Your stomach turns. I've never had a dream in colour. You feel the heat come into your face as you say this. A jagged white light flashes in front of the students. It keeps flashing across their faces and over their heads. You start to feel sick. Today, you look up as your name is called for you to go in to see the geriatrician. You turn off your phone and close the vivid footage from the war zone. You go through to the doctor, despondent. Doctor, I'm getting the aura, no headache. I don't feel sick. My eyes are not sensitive to light. You try to be accurate. But it's happening more often, it's affecting my vision. Sometimes I can't see properly. What is it? You are anxious. You sigh loudly. 
And as you stand there, you notice your exhaled breath moving into the shaft of sunlight that comes through a small gap in the blinds. These minuscule droplets dance in the light. They create a swirling supernova of colors. You are mesmerized. Warm hands support your shoulders. And although the doctor fusses and calls, you don't listen. Instead, you are dazzled by an irresistible radiance. The right side of your body is now numb. You cannot speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, so this brings us now to a short break. Um, so um, if we come back um, in five minutes, um, then we'll uh, go straight into the next piece from Ansuya Patel. Um, I'm just going to also put in the chat um, a link again to the uh, uh, to where you can buy or download for free the ebook uh, version of Between the Lines. And if you've enjoyed the readings, um, please do download it and um, tell your friends, uh, even tell your enemies, give them something to read. Um, thank you very much. And we'll, we'll see you around quarter past. Um, okay, see you in a bit. All right, hello. Welcome back from a brief little break. Um, I hope you've all been enjoying the reading so far. They have been brilliant. I've really, really enjoyed listening to all of them. Um, so we're gonna go straight into our next reader now, um, which is a poem from Ansuya Patel. Um, Ansuya, over to you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My poem is called The Philonopsis. Start with a plant, then maybe a pet, before you move on to a relationship. I bought a cactus, did with the label, overwatered it and kept it in the shade. It rotted, then I fell in love with a blood orange goldfish. Her pale yellow flowing fins entranced me. I'd gaze at her for hours, playing, until I went away that weekend. To find her sunk at the bottom, her mouth open, blowing me a final kiss. You gave me a flowering philinopsis. Its snow-white petals with open faces smiled on my windowsill. I read the label, kept it as a love letter, and misted the leaves with water until mealybugs arrived. Throw it out, it's dead, you said. Maybe you were ready to give up. I cleansed the leaves morning and evening with a dab of chin and trimmed her dead roots. I sat beside her and sketched her curves in pencil. Spring came and she's flowering, unafraid of tomorrow. Baby bugs hang from her stem like jewels, tender to touch. Have nature thrives. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Ansia. Thank you. Um, okay, coming up next is Kevin Bond with a story. Thank you, Kevin. Hiya. This is the story that came out of Vicky Group's short story writing class last year. The robot in the red dress. There's a bar in the spaceport on Chiron. You should visit, but don't take the in-laws. It's a dive. He takes dive to a whole new low, kicks it under the carpet, stamps on the carpet, and spits on it for good measure. I tap the barkeep for another shot. He rattled along tracks as I stuffed a credit in the slot. The glass was slammed down on sticky acrylic and wobbled. I slammed it and wobbled sympathetically. Hey, stranger, buy a girl a drink? Big fake eyelashes fluttered. The dress, burning autumn leaves earth autumn leaves. I saw architectural heels. I smell static. I recognised her. Sure, if you can find me one, I played it cool. I tapped again and stuck up two fingers. Credit in slot. Two more shots. You're funny, she said. I looked over her shoulders to the ash grey horizon and black on black sky. Here's to the trees. Nothing. They said they've got no sense of humour. Sometimes it happens this way. You find the party you've been hired to trace without trying. Sometimes. This party, on the lamp since the recently acquired husband crashed and burned on a sightseeing trip to the asteroid belt. Insurance policy recently amended. Insurance company and extant daughters dubious. Second wives have that effect, particularly artificial ones. She could have swapped her face, gone for a skin job, but she hadn't. We both sipped, observing each other. The big fake eyelashes batting over the big fake eyes. So, what's a handsome hunk like you doing in a miserable rock like this? She swirled ethanol and ice cubes. It's fuel to them. Oh, I spun a sad little paper coaster. I shed a silent tear for it. No coaster should have to go through this. I'm a skip tracer, insurance, on a case. I looked at the dress. 
It was a fine dress. I hadn't noticed the transparent coins floating around in it. She smiled in a I'm so sorry way that might have been genuine. It was a sweet smile. The smile fit to launch a thousand ships, ships with black sails. The transparent coins went opaque. I gripped the acrylic bar top hard and watched this bartender go sideways. Wake up, bright boy. My face rested on cold metal. I blinked and saw my life arranged in front of me. The cop was flicking through it, chewing on a toothpick. Bill Harrison, PI's license about to expire. Travel car and just about in order. Give me a reason not to throw you in the tank for being drunk and disorderly on federal property. I, made, I raised myself on one elbow. He picked out a crumbled photo, gave it the fisheye and whistled through a toothpick. That's why I'm here. Skip jog. A Nexus 9. She's good. Spiked me as soon as I tagged her. I watched as the toothpick described an eccentric orbit around his mouth. He breathed a big sad sigh and sat back. The chair complained. They give me the creeps. He threw the picture down. Okay, Harrison, you've got 18 hours. That's when the next rocket goes. Be on it. Nexus 9 or no Nexus 9. Okay, I said. I had a sore head and an unfinished case. I checked in at the Mayflower. It was all brown and cream, ice machines, ersatz coffee and cigarette smoke. I'm all in, I said to the reception box. I figured four or five hours sleep would still give me a good day to track down the party. I held up the photo to the box. Recognize her? Nothing. I fumbled the lock and surveyed the room in the glimmer of the glow globes. I flopped down on the bed and hit the floor through the loose springs. Then, a buzz. Turn down? I guess it's night. I lost track. Sure. The door clicks open. I'm expecting a box on wheels, but it's a humanoid. The woman fusses with the lights and the curtains. She sidles to the bed. I prickle. It's her. I'm transfixed, then mummified, pinned and bound. I never saw her move. She hovers over me, her breath ketones and hydrocarbons. Flick, flick those eyelashes. I'm scared. I'm powerless. Why did you make the joke about the forests? I tried to shrug. I like trees. I dream about them. I've never seen one. I bought a forest with the insurance money. It's out there in the orbital junkyard, an old geodesic dome tended to by a drone. The hydraulics relax. I'm able to move. From the Valley Forge? I thought that was an old space dog's tail, Earth's last forest, rescued then set adrift from a commercial freighter before it got nuked. No, it's real. It's still growing. I like trees. I dream about them too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was a really fun piece. Um, yeah, just imagining, um, trying to think of a sci-fi pun for Humphrey Bogart, but I, I couldn't think of one in time, but I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, that was Kevin Bond. Uh, coming up next, Kath Gifford. Kath, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas and uh, Cattell. And uh, thank you to City Lit for facilitating my return to poetry during lockdown and shielding. And a special thanks to Sarah Westcott, Julia Goray, Christina Dunhill and Sarah Wardle. Um, this is one of an alphabetic sequence about animal idioms in different forms. And a dancer is an old French form of lyric poetry developed by the 13th century troubadours. And like the ballad, its name derives from words to dance. The dancer of dog days. And I've been working like a dog, eating everything in sight. In the doghouse, what's wrong or right? Sick as a dog from too much grog. And I've been working like a dog. Barking up the wrong tree avoids a fight until they come down from their height. Hair of the dog, now drunk and flogged, and I've been working like a dog. Teaching new tricks to old dogs might surprise and offer proud delight. Never too old to play leapfrog, and I've been working like a dog. A dog in church, Italian sight, a skunk with a party invite. The unwanted guest with monologue, and I've been working like a dog. Each dog has its day in the light, but don't too quickly overexcite. Soon back to just another cog and I've been working like a dog. Lie down with dogs and fleas that bite, what's raining cats and dogs all night. Need a break from this sad catalogue when you've been working like a dog. The dog is buried, the Germans write, reveals the truth or resting sight, so hide it deep to stay in cog if you've been working like a dog. Make the most of what you've got, despite no dog, try a cat to cause a fright. But hunting could be quite a slog, even if working like a dog. In a dog-eat-dog -dog world, their bite would be worse than their bark, a plight that could end up in the morgue, and I've been working like a dog. Like the beetles and their hard day's night, getting home makes it all all right, finally getting to sleep like a log, because I've been working like a dog. Time to let those sleeping dogs lie. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Kath, and a fitting poem for the end of the working week as well. Thank you very much. Um, coming up next is Diana Volk uh, with a poem. Diana, over to you. Hi, um, this is a poem I wrote in Christina Dunhill's Developing Your Poetry. The Long Barrow. It appeared like a raised rough scar on the ridgetop, stuffed with bone, sutured with soil and stone, but now grown over with close clipped grass, spotted with bindweed and clover. As we ascended the slope, we passed a gnarled tree decorated with ribbons, threadbare and quivering in the breeze. The unseasonably cold spring had ended abruptly and we shed our layers as we walked. At the top, children clambered over the barrow, parents yelled, couples ambled around it. We gravitated to its dark interior. Boulders lined the entrance, smoothed by years of fingertips. We crossed into the quiet cool, heavy with damp and the tang of stale urine. Pockmarked with hollows, the walls held offerings of dried flowers and splintered incense sticks, powdery ash piled beneath them. I reached the back wall looking for an explanation, but found only a child's face peering down at me through the scratched skylight drilled above. Emerging into the brilliance of the day, we sprawled on the slope at the far end of the barrow, the five of us lying prone, arms spread as if signaling semaphore. Shading my eyes, I squinted up at a complex twittering, a skylark, a fluttering speck of life in the blue, so small I almost couldn't be sure it was there until it started its descent. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, coming up next, we have Anita Horton with a with a story. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, and you pronounced Horton right. Thank you, Thomas. Um, this is a very short piece that I wrote around this time last year in Vicky Groot's wonderful short story class, and it's called Waves. We met in hall in those early disorienting days. You slept on my floor and we talked till late. You listened like no one had. We ate bread and jam and peanut butter. You drank huge bottles of Diet Coke. We got drunk in Hyde Park on pineapple juice and Southern Comfort. You threw up in the taxi. You let me cut your hair. You never forgave me. One winter, we moved to Finsbury Park. We huddled round a gas fire and took turns to flip the records. We ran out of coins for the meter. We drank cider and ate sweet and sour chicken. We had dinner at the top of the post office tower. When I came back from the loo, I couldn't find you. You made a pass at me, I, I didn't mind. I met a man. We worked in another city, I missed you. We came back and you often slept in our spare room. We went to the pub together, laughed together. You met a woman. You no longer slept in our spare room. My mother died. I had a baby. You visited me in hospital. You came back for a while. You fell in love again. This one broke your heart. This one broke your heart. You bought a new house. You painted it white and beige. You built a conservatory. You threw lunch parties. You met another woman. You gave it all up to give her a baby. It died before it was born. My man died. You helped me pack his clothes into black bags. You battled with the cleaner. You held my hand. Your woman left you. You lost your mind. You railed and railed, and I began to lose mine. You were in hospital. 
It all went wrong. I came back early from holiday. I, I brought you cake. You wanted biscuits. I, I offered my home. You turned to your sister. You broke my heart. You broke my heart. You have a son. Your weekends are full of soft play and Lego. You have migraines and a dodgy knee. You gave me a framed postage stamp with the post office tower for my birthday. It sits on my bookcase. My children live in flats. I attend creative writing classes. I have other friends. I still love you. You still love me. It is different. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for, for that beautiful, tender piece. Thank you. Um, so next we have a poem from Urve Opik. Urve, over to you. Hi. Firstly, I'd like to say what a great resource City Lit is and how much fun it is to learn there. I particularly want to name a couple of the tutors, Ella Frears and Christina Dunhill, uh, studied with and learned so much with. And the fellow students, always great to have companions in learning. Ecdesis. Don't get too comfy in that skin of yours. At times, you'll need to wear it in reverse, or even shed your pelt to shuck the fears. And that's a lot to wait. So like a shirt, just fold it here, then put the box away. But carefully, the hinges can't be forced. You have to squeeze them shut in the same way you learn to co close yourself against the cold, remember? As if you did it every day, deliberately, with casual control. The skill is in the fluent show of ease, despite that freezing slick beneath your clothes. It doesn't hurt so much if you release your bones and let the ligaments unlace. A carapace will harden by degrees to clasp that undone weight of you in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ove. Um, we've got two more pieces, and um, the first of which is coming from Ruth Railton. Ruth, over to you. Hi everyone, can you see me? Hopefully that's a yes. Um, I can see you, I can. Oh good. <laughs> um, I'm Ruth, I'm going to read um, a poem that I wrote last year in Christina Dunhill's class um, called Have You Tried Acupuncture? And it's written in a syllabic metre of 575 where you count the syllables rather than stresses. Um, and you can't see this because you can't see the poem, but it's resulted in a lot of very strange line breaks and hyphenated words where you wouldn't normally expect them. Um, and this has created a, a kind of awkwardness that I hope matches the subject matter. Have you tried acupuncture? I've tried meditation, gong baths, soaked up by normal beats, had my nerves niggled, and womb wiggled by way of reflexology. Unlocked my unconscious with hypnosis, connected breath consciously. Placed my derriere in St. Maria's miracle chair, dipped my toe in EFT. Did a visualization of my desired creation, prayed to Shiva and Parvati. Got rid of plastics and all things nonstick, became certified BPA free. Unbarred my chakras, repeated mantras. I trust and love my body. Clutched onto rhodochrosite and iolite to strengthen feminine energy. Stuck my feet up the wall, bounced on an exercise ball, massaged my ovaries. Plunged under cold blasts for temperature contrast, awoke my Kundalini. Tingled with tongue clicks, chomped down seed mix, Tap my clavicle to my knees. Guzzled beetroot juice, 
opened the fish oil sluice, went gluten, dairy, and sugar-free. Underwent energy healing to release pent-up feelings, had low-level laser therapy, drained my lymph nodes, jump-started by electrodes, unblocked my sputtering chi, but still no baby. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you for that poem. And the final piece today is from Saraswati Sukumar. Um, Saraswati, over to you for the final piece today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So this is an extract from my retelling of Snow White. Mud. I dangle from a hook above the hearth. Moments ago, I was nearly swallowed whole by the flames as they curled and wound round and up in their ceremonial lick dance. The heat is comforting, though the rumblings of my poor stomach grow louder. Centuries ago, I was honoured with a feast, my first, my only, until today. Here I have hung, waiting, watching, births, deaths, feasts, Tables laden with toad eyes, courtiers stuffing their mouths with donkey livers, children running with lizard tails swinging from between their clamped lips, servants crunching on owl beaks stolen from half-eaten plates. My stepqueen enjoyed the occasional heart. Human, of course. I would watch as the juices dribble down her chin. Then there were the prisoners. Oh, how my tongue watered as they were dragged before the majesties. But alas, they were struck down where they stood. Such a cruelty to perform an execution without giving me a taste. Not a single morsel in all these years. Tonight, there will be a celebration as the new queen takes her throne. Two kingdoms finally united. My makers will be sorely disappointed. But what care I when I am to be fed? After tonight, I shall tell tales of my queen's kindness. And, were it not for the queen's long-lost sister, I may have spent another few centuries with naught but memory to curb my famine. Memory, huh, a mere ghost, cold, pungent, like cooked pig's feet left out to rot, fleas and flies pecking at it. In the end, all that's left is bone. What good is bone? Gratitude aside, I am indebted to no persons. One must not forget that were it not for me, they would have both suffered the cruelest of fates. Eighteen years ago, my late mistress, Queen Grey, had been circling the Yamajavadru, the twin rose trees, for several hours. Beads of sweat trickled down my late queen's forehead. She did not wipe them away. Had she allowed me, I would have licked them away for her. She knelt in the soil and looked up at the trees. One Javadru bore white roses and the other bore red roses. They have stood there since my birth, since the days of the first queen, always bright, always in bloom. Each of the queens before her had given birth to one child, always one, always a daughter. But Queen Grey had given birth to two, both male, both stillborn. She dug her fingers into the earth. Give me another, she whispered to the ground, choking back sobs. She squeezed her hands deeper into the earth. Buried thorns pierced her skin, spilled tears darkened the soil. Nine months later, the babe squealed. In one corner stood the castle physician his head bowed, arms in front, hands placed one atop the other as if in prayer. To his left stood two maids. They too had their heads bowed, though every now and then they exchanged eyebrow-raised, wide-eyed glances. Under the physician's orders they had remained in the room, the bloody sheets clutched in their hands. No doubt he believed this visual would pacify the king. It did not. The three of them would be dead before sunset. By the queen's bedside stood her personal healer. Ignoring the physician's command to step back, 
the healer had opted instead to dab the sweat on the queen's forehead with a cooling cloth. The king strode into the room, peered at the bundle in the queen's arms, then wrapped his hand around the queen's throat. Whose is it? Y yours, the queen choked. It wears neither my skin nor yours. Which servant did you spread your legs for? I didn't. The king squeezed tighter. Your Highness, the physician said softly. She is the queen. The king released his hold, slowly. He stepped back. He ground his teeth. Get rid of this filth. You, he growled at the healer. Take it. Leave it to burn under the hot sun. No, no, screamed the queen, though she knew it was futile. As the king turned away, she grabbed a hold of the healer's arm, pulled her close and whispered in her ear. The healer took the bundle and hurried from the chamber. She stopped in the throne room and walked towards the hearth. I remember her heart pounding. Dup, 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 dup. She pressed the babe's foot against me, as is the custom. To add to the long, albeit slow-growing list, she peered into my mouth and whispered the two words. Mud brown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Swathi, and thank you to all of the readers today. I, th I think um, you listening at home, you agree with me that it was a fantastic um, set of readings, really, really enjoyable. So thank you, everyone. Um, and also, just again, to flog this ebook or this actual printed copy that you can order using the link I've just put in, please do so. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, little publication with all of these readings and more pieces in there from um, students' work uh, from City Lit in 2022. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you have a lovely evening um, and a great weekend. And, um, and yeah, all right. Hopefully see you again at a different event. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.